And I would like to give the floor to Sergio Cárdenas, General Director of CREFAL. He will introduce Mr. Alan Tuquet. Good morning. I am happy to introduce to you Dr. Alan Tucker. He is an educator, education professor, member of the board for lifelong learning at UNESCO, one of the seven education entities focused on continuous education, literacy, and formal basic education for adults. He is a distinguished member for lifelong learning at EDIT. Sir Alan Tocquet, he is an international expert on adult education, and he has been advisor for UNESCO and for lifelong learning issues from 2001. He has been director of lifelong learning and he was the director of a research and development program. He has been advisor for different ministers, and he has been chair of Fresh School Learning Advisor since 2001, and he has more than 40 years in governance matters. He has conducted different consulting works for Palestine and for the Office of Scientific Purpose perspective for United Kingdom, for the UNESCO, the National Trust, and different TV channels. He has been presented with the Britannic Award in 2005, and he has received uh, different awards from different colleges. He is member of the Hall of Fame for Adult Education in the University of Oklahoma since 2006. He has written different publications, different papers, and some articles in our magazines. The, the most recent one have been co-written with Adol Nash, and it's entitled Lifelong Learning, Social Transformation, and Social Prosecution in the European Magazine. I would like to mention because i been witnessing this. He likes to materialize everything that he has written in the practice. So let's give him a hand. And we will give the floor now to Dr. Alan Tucker. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to talk in English. Um, I apologize for the introduction. It's like listening to your obituary while you're still alive. And I'm uh, very grateful for the invitation to Mexico. Um, I'm a, a, really a practitioner who uh, became frustrated um, at how difficult it was to um, make uh, what we saw working with adult learners happen uh, explicable to politicians. So um, my own approach to the challenges we're going to um, look at today, I've put my little machine away, which is silly, um, is, um, it is to say, who isn't there? So sorry. They've given me a little machine to uh, <laughs> I can't. Oh, hey, great. <laughs> I put it down. Uh, as you can see, I should say at the beginning, I'm incompetent. Um, um, my approach to the challenges is: who isn't there, and what can we, uh, what can be done about it? To ask it in any context what works, how far it's specific to the context, and how far can we reproduce it. How can we share what we find out with politicians, with policy makers, with providers, teachers, and uh, the wider population? Um, the UN in 2015, as part of the um, uh, forward vision to 2030, said 
Everybody, is irrespective of sex, age, race, ethnicity, and persons with disabilities, migrants, indigenous peoples, children and youth, especially those in vulnerable situations, should have access to lifelong learning opportunities that help them acquire the knowledge and skills needed to exploit opportunities and to participate fully in society. These are wonderful words. The challenge is to match rhetoric with practice. In um, my uh, perspective, lifelong learning for a world worth living in for us involves learning how to address social, political and environmental challenge, change and recognising the challenges that people face in the light of that. Um, if you look at where we are now in the world, and obviously as I speak I come from um, um, uh, an old um, and has been rather privileged bit of the world um, uh, that suffers these changes just as dramatically as anywhere else. Um, the globalisation of goods and services had the impact of shifting um, well-developed forms of work and to distribute them at speed around the world. The result, in a way, um, particularly reinforced, I think, by neoliberal policies, have been a series of economic crises in different parts of the globe. We are seeing quite dramatic climate change um, happening, despite... Um, President Bush's perspective. We have uh, demographic change at both ends of the spectrum with people living a, a good deal longer um, and also large numbers of people um, um, uh, being, being born in particularly in the global south. Uh, and we have massive migration going on. With, if you put climate change and migration together, you can see that as water levels rise, enormous numbers of people, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, will be displaced uh, into neighbouring countries. Migration within countries and across countries represents a challenge for all of us in terms of those people who move, having to adjust, the people receiving um, migration, and the people who have been left behind. A key element of change currently derives from the fourth industrial revolution, from the development of artificial um, intelligence, robotics, and wider technological changes. They produce changes, dramatic ones, to the pattern of work. Uh, of work. Some analysts say that we shall see white collar jobs being eradicated at the same speed that we saw uh, manufacturing uh, jobs disappear. Um, they have an impact on community cohesion. There are in all of our societies contested values and in many societies democratic deficits uh, uh, as well. Um, and what does all this mean for adult education? Well, uh, what it means first is for the people that we serve, that um, neoliberal policies privilege markets, and those global markets have reinforced right across the world the gaps between the wealthy and the poor. You've only to look at the concentration of surpluses that Amazon or Google, uh, for example, throw up to see that those resources have come from somewhere, and they've come from uh, uh, communities that were used to recycling their own um, wealth. Gender inequality persists everywhere. Indigenous peoples are too often marginalised by the changes happening. Linguistic and ethnic minorities are discriminated against, and whether that's intentional or, or not, it happens. Climate change has most negative impact on the poorest, and you know my, my own view is that in in the global context we have a great deal to learn from the focus um, on uh, the rights of Mother Earth that uh, uh, been developed in uh, Latin American countries. Um, Population ageing increases pressures on social spending and often on women's lives. And technological change impacts most on poorer and less 
educated people, that throws up an enormous agenda of what do we do about it what, and what will work. On the other hand, we can see rising life expectancy around the world. A lot of, um, many of us have improved living standards. There's a potential arriving, arises from the, the new technologies. We can improve communications with, um, uh, with one another. As you were saying, this talk can be watched by people who don't have to be here. Um, whether that's an improvement or not is another matter. Um, uh, and a recognition that growth is not the only way of measuring um, the, the uh, va value of uh, social change and that well-being matters as well. This slide is rather crude, it's not very sharp. I took it from uh, the German newspaper Der Spiegel on Monday this week. And what it shows mm. is the impact already of um, robotics on, on employment. And um, the, the numbers in red are the total numbers of jobs displaced so far in different, particularly East Asian countries. Um, uh, but the, the bluer colour shows how many people per 100,000 have lost their posts? Well, you can see in the top right-hand corner that Korea is the country with the uh, quickest uh, uh, implementation of impact on their, uh, on, on their economy. And bottom right, Singapore too. Uh, the bottom left, Germany is not far behind it. But right across the region, there are impacts on uh, what kinds of jobs um, people can do. And uh, to take a European um, um, survey picture, we can see that the numbers, that they, the blue and red at the top are low-skilled adults, the ones in the middle are medium-skilled, and the ones at the bottom are high-skilled. As all these economic and industrial changes happen, the demand comes for people to have higher and higher levels of, of qualification and, and skills. And uh, for people with the lowest levels of skill, there is a reduction of uh, overall opportunity um, uh, going along. Um, there was mention in the introduction of the importance of adult literacy, and by the most crude measure of, um, uh, of our, do we have a literate population, can you read a single sentence, we know that um, we still got 745 million uh, illiterate adults, and this picture is from 2015. Doubtless we can argue that it's marginally shifted since. But in the global north as well, 160 million people with uh, literacy problems, and it's where my own work began, was helping to start a campaign to teach adults to read and write in Britain. We tell UNESCO we have 100% literacy rates, but at the same time we recognise 8 million people have problems in Britain. Um, you can see from the pretty picture at the bottom that there's been quite a significant shift to improve uh, over those years, but nevertheless, for um, getting on for a billion people, the, there is a challenge to be able to engage with the way that those issues of social change that I highlighted in uncertain times could be dealt with. Nevertheless, there are wonderful things you can do with technology. These four women are Serbian grandmothers. They're sitting outside their house and they've been introduced to Skype on, on a, a portable computer and are able to talk to their great-grandchildren in Australia. They've never had any contact with them, they don't speak English, but never, and the children growing up in Australia do, but nevertheless that closing of the, the, the distance across the world can be empowering and exhilarating. Um, in 1996, Jacques Delors uh, coordinated the UNESCO paper Learning the Treasure Within, arguing that um, there are four pillars for a learning society. You need to be able to learn to know, learning to do, learning to be, uh, confident identity, and learning to live together. And I think if you look at the evidence globally, we're much, much more confident about learning to know and learning to do than we are about learning to be and learning to live together. And yet, when you think about the next 30 years, um, getting the balance between those four dimensions right seems to me a significant challenge for Crefal and for all the rest of us. 
I mean, the Sustainable Development Goals identified the complex interlocking nature of the challenges we're facing in the globe. And in the International Council for Adult Education, where I, I was, uh, have been involved for a, a number of years, we made the case that in order to implement almost any of these, you need education and the education of adults. If you put um, toilets into rural Indian communities, you have to persuade people what the relationship between these machines and infant mortality is. You have to, if you want to stop people smoking, they need convincing that the uh, scientific evidence is something that has a relevance for themselves and their families across the piece around health, around anti-poverty. Uh, um, there, there are, there is the case to be made for the transversal role of adult learning. But that throws up one of the problems. It's almost like if somebody says, who in the class would like to answer this question? And you put your hand up and say, I would. And then the next question, I would, I would. We believe that adult learning has a role in all of these dimensions. And indeed, um, when we came to SDG 4, the one explicitly related to education, we were delighted to see that ensure quality and ed equitable education for all and promote lifelong learning was the headline title. But when you ask what does this mean for youth and, and, and adult education, well, adult education isn't even mentioned in the detail of the subsidiary targets. So yes, there's goodwill. There's not really enough data about what works, who's doing what, and hard for decision makers uh, not, to, um, uh, not to ask, give me the data, before they change their policies. There's certainly not enough finance. And I think globally, the vast majority of countries spend less than three tenths of one percent of their education budgets on the, edu uh, on the education of adults. When I was a principal in, in London um, in the 1980s, we spent 3% of our budget. And the impact in terms of the common sense of people expecting to be able to use learning opportunities was significant. We have wonderful rhetoric from the SDGs. No one should be left behind. But uh, when you look at the numbers, I mean, I've said governments haven't spent as much as they would like to, but uh, if you look at the little lines at the bottom of this chart, they show how much is being spent, the bottom three ones, on early years on adult education and youth education and on vocational education beyond secondary school. All of them find that uh, uh, we've found that although our rhetoric has changed over 15 years, the pressure on on international aid budgets, just the same as on governments, have um, uh, uh, have maintained the focus on um, uh, on other areas of the education budget. In part, that was reinforced by the focus of the Millennium Development Goals. But nevertheless, that continues to affect us. We asked. Um, the head of the Global Partnership of Education, Julia Gillard, um, how um, the, the aspirations for lifelong learning um, and, and literacy were to be achieved. And she said, well, we've no money for that. We'll have to organize that charitably. Well, that kind of mindset is the one we need the, to develop the arguments uh, in proper dialogue with decision makers to understand the price we pay if we don't have an educated population. Um, th this chart from the, taken from the, the latest global um, monitoring report, education monitoring report, highlights um, just what can be done when alongside primary and secondary education there's a commitment to investment in second chance education for adults. And the column on the very right of my picture shows the experience in Bolivia where um, one in um, one in eight adults without uh, secondary school qualifications has been able to participate in second chance education. It's much harder in, in some other countries, but nevertheless, there are really positive illustrative mm -hmm. examples. So when you look at this picture of wonderful rhetoric and of, of uh, um, fairly modest practice, you ask the question, well, who might 
need to do what? And I think there's no question that overall, uh, as well as data and finance, governments need to think about strategy and how to engage, you can't do it all from the middle, um, how to engage other stakeholders in the, in, the, in the view. I think, too, they need to recognise the importance not only of formal education and things that lead to structured qualifications, but the value of non-formal uh, and informal learning. Employers need to recognise that to be able to deal with the kind of economic changes I was highlighting, investing more across the whole of your workforce is important. I mean, the global picture is that when employers invest, they invest in people who've already, or already got some education and or are relatively uh, senior. Everybody needs to be involved. And for providers, there's a challenge about adapting, adapting curricula, modes of learning, credit structures, but also partnerships with civil society um, and uh, a focus too on engaging people if we're to reach um, the people who aren't there and to um, look at that long list in the first UN slide I showed of the communities particularly <coughs> vulnerable to uh, change. And when we think about what research we might commission, I think um, the challenge for us all is how to avoid overvaluing what's easily measured at the expense of reflexibility, reflection, teamworking, resilience, the kind of skills that are critical to the new and modern era. I think too um, we need to involve the voice of learners in the co-production of the changes that we're uh, undertaking. Um, UNESCO, um, since the Confintea, uh, UNESCO UIL, with Raoul will talk about this I'm sure tomorrow, um, has had these five foci of its work on policy, governance, financing, participation and quality and they, I think they all need to be addressed in Crafal's mm -hmm. forward-looking um, agenda. Um, but I think to we have to concern ourselves with motivation for recognising if you didn't go to school in the first place and you've got by so far, why should I bother? Is the question people will ask. And if you did go to school and you didn't like it or they didn't like you, then you need persuading that to have a second chance to come back may be different. And the very distinguished uh, Indian adult educator, Harbans Bowler, he, he makes a distinction about adult education between culture and structure. He says, within the adult education culture, adults educate other adults by beating drums for attention, singing folk songs, um, and shouting messages over loudspeakers, putting posters on the wall, organizing exhibits. By organizing political and religious functions on street corners or in city parks and spreading the message on uh, radio and television. Of course, he also recognizes it's a matter of good structures, well trained teachers, registers, uh, regularity of student uh, attendance, and good assessment processes. But this half of the agenda, I think, is often missing from the way in which we think about how we uh, design our programs. Partly because when you offer education for children at school, we tend to think of the curriculum beginning when they arrive at school, but for adults the curriculum begins in wooing people to become uh, active voluntary participants. Unless you're in the army and they send you to <laughs> education, but you've still then got to motivate people to want to do it. I mean, one illustration of the um, motivational energy I, I found was when I attended the World Social Forum in, uh, Porto Alegre, but um, um, uh, I now want to move on to what, what are the key issues, so three or four key issues that I think are of particular challenge for us in the next period. 19th century English writer Thomas Carlyle said, it's the first duty of government to see that the people can think. Now if you look back at those issues I raised under uncertain challenges, each of them involve rather difficult choices for societies. And the more we can engage everyone in the understanding what it means for them, for their communities and their wider societies, the better we'll go on. The, uh, uh, another, well, a Welsh European, he didn't like to be thought of as British, uh, writer, um, 
um, Raymond Williams um, said, at times of change, like we're going through now, adults turn to learning to understand what's going on, to make adjustments in the light of it, and then, most importantly, to help shape change. And it seems to me for educators, the issue in all of those areas is to go through that three-fold cycle. Of course, um, in, in the work of Freire, the clarity that education is dialogical, that you, you don't have to think only about curricula when you're thinking about learning, that people working and acting on one another, and the task being to read the world and not just the word, is a, a, a critical one. I remember from almost the first of the books of his I read that uh, one of his students from Chife saying, I want to read and write to stop being the shadow of other people. Well, my experience of teaching literacy is that the crunch issue here is helping people understand the power of language, the ideas of language, the ability to be able to draw your, on your own experience and to bring that to bear in the work. And that um, the technical skills are important, of course, but they're secondary and complementary skills. So I think the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda poses quite a policy and research uh, challenge for us. Those last three slides are really about asking, how do we secure an informed citizenship? How do we overcome exclusion and marginalization? How do we foster respect for difference and diversity? And how do we show the value of um, youth and adult ed education to other uh, sustainable development goal agendas. Um, it's hard to know in education that you could make life easier for health providers who are under pressure of budgets because um, uh, one senior civil servant said to me early in my career that he knew no bureaucrat who had had a great career out of making a triumph for the minister of another mm -hmm. department of government. People work within their silos too, too often, um, and that, well, you know, for all of our futures, we have to think about adult, uh, how adult learning can deal with um, the challenges of sustainability and of work, and, well, there's no doubt that we need good data capturing, I'm sure Aaron will talk to us about that. I want to take the illustration of health here. People who, with more education, live longer and they also live healthier lives. If you develop Alzheimer's disease, um, if you're an active learner, you have active neural networks that go around the problem until much later in the process. So you live a, a more engaged life as a citizen, a parent, a, a family member uh, until later on. Of course, there's also emerging evidence that it might uh, inhibit uh, the development of Alzheimer's altogether. Um, nobody goes to a class on uh, how to use the computer in order to give up smoking. But we found that across the piece in the uh, wider benefits of learning studies that we did in the UK, that learners are dramatically more likely to give up smoking than, uh, than people who haven't been learning. They, they took a, a, the whole sample of people born in the same week in 1947 and went back every seven years and asked questions of them. So by adding questions about adults into this, you could see what was the impact of having been participating in classes. Not necessarily causal, but certainly strongly association. Learning, I think, the southern sub-Saharan African illustration shows that you get a lower incidence of HIV AIDS, that uh, learning is associated with both uh, uh, lower infant mortality and maternal um, mortality. It helps maintain mental health. Um, at least in the UK, we have a major crisis of poor mental health. And, um, when you are recovering from a period of poor mental health, the, the kind of low threshold of a class where if you don't feel well enough to go, it, it, it can be much more of a, a, a bridge to returning to social contact than a, a formally organised uh, meeting room. Um, learners have higher trust levels 
And in Britain anyway, as we get older, we apparently become more politically cynical. Um, but learners become politically cynical at a lower rate than other people, which I thought was a very good argument for um, politicians to invest in us. Um, and um, about all these things I've just said, they're true whatever you're studying and whatever level you study at, so that it's the act of learning that is industri the industrial skill. And that seems to me something we need to tease out and flesh out and make more, more accessible to, um, um, to everyone. This slide, uh, again borrowed from the um, Global Education Monitoring Report, says, so why doesn't adult learning and education have a bigger impact on health? I'm sorry, you can't really read it from here, but the figure on the left says that 90 countries said, well, it was the it, it, um, amount of illiteracy that affected um, whether you could make a more efficient link between education and health. 56 countries said it was household income inequalities. 45 said, well, it's poor pedagogy, training materials, staff training and capacity. 41 said lack of information. Um, uh, 49 said poor interdepartmental or intersectoral mm -hmm. cooperation. Um, only 39 said community resistance. Um, and then, you know, the funding wasn't spent very well too. Move on to work. And you can see that for paid work, Learning makes you more employable. It offers you access to the labor market. It offers opportunities for career progression and chances to switch employment. And that's for people in the waged economy. For informal work, work um, not covered by taxation, not, not covered by the laws. Increased skill can lead to better understanding of markets and all those health benefits that I just mentioned. For organization, well, staff learning in, offers increased productivity, at least as long as you've got well-organized organizations, leads to an engaged workforce, the ability to adapt to technological change. But, you know, um, as already said, employers tend to invest more in the well-qualified and highly paid than in staff with few or new qualifications. And across the globe, women still get less pay and less access to, to training. Perhaps not in your individual <laughs> countries, but that's broadly true. So formal learning and qualifications are what we tend to talk about in relation to the labour market. And they're really clearly significant at labour market entry, at the point that you get a job, and sometimes they're critical in getting promotion. But all of us here today will know that the informal learning we've done in the jobs we do, as we go along, reflect on what we do, are just as critical in helping you keep the job and in helping you to develop the quality of work that you're involved with. Firms, um, this is borrowing my, my colleague Lorna Runwin's work, can be expansive helping and encouraging workers to exercise judgment, to innovate, or to share ideas on the one hand, or, or they can be restricted, limiting the freedom. I mean, I don't want to be rude about them, but you, you can go and work for McDonald's anywhere in any country and you'll know exactly what you need to do because they have a well-tried system for doing things. And although they have a very well-developed um, education and promotion structure within the company, it's not doing the work that will develop you in that way. So uh, uh, what, what Lorna Runwin's research did was to say a whole series of sandwich shops, university research departments, manufacturing, uh, pairing organisations which concentrated on giving workers uh, um, the opportunity to help make decisions and those where the job was very clearly delimited. And the finding, of course, is that expansive workplaces foster more learning. And in most circumstances, but not all, they also foster greater productivity. Mm -hmm. So I think um, looking again at Crefal's next 30 years, a key challenge for us is in designing vocational programs that balance 
skills we know how to measure, with the key industrial capabilities for the new era, and um, they include creativity, problem solving, collaboration and team working, self-control, financial literacy, critical skills, flexibility, we should say tolerance, trust, perseverance, and social skills. Perseverance is particularly important. But, you know, if I think put myself in the position of being a government minister for the moment, uh, ask the question of the vocational programs I'm being asked to pay for, and say, well, how do we know if provision is good if all these qualities are so very hard to measure? And then I think you're led inexorably to the view that whilst quantitative measures help us um, quickly to see the, sh the scale of what we're doing, it's the combination of quantitative and qualitative research that you need in order, in order to avoid what uh, Einstein said when he said that uh, not everything worth measuring can be measured and not everything worth counting counts. Um, in uh, the organisation I worked with in Britain, we commissioned a lifelong learning strategy and I, I think it's made an interesting contribution by thinking about lifelong learning across four life stages of post-compulsory work. That is, if you take people, young people leaving school or not having been to school and their um, early engagement with where will I sit in the world of work, trying out different jobs, finding, uh, finding themselves with increasingly varied patterns across the globe of labour market entry. Then another group of people, many of you here I think, between 25 and 50, who have an enormous range of things going on at once, who have to juggle work, family, social activity, and sometimes struggle um, to find space for uh, engaging in learning. And if 25 to 50s tend to be overused, then people like me in the third age, 50 to 75 roughly, I mean, these are not hard numbers, <laughs> but people in that, that, that age group, um, you know, they have high levels of civic engagement. In many countries, they're, they're the way that the non-waged economy works. It's grandmothers looking after children whilst uh, both parents uh, go out to work. It's keeping voluntary associations going, um, maintaining the dynamic of church life in, in people's lives and so on. To go back to the 25 to 50s, there's a very interesting chart from our long-term surveys as well, which shows that up to the age of 42, life gets harder and harder for people once they've reached 25, they become more and more miserable. But for every year you live longer than 42, things get better. Now I'm 70, I can assure you that's right. Um, when you reach 75 or so, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, was a joke. Um, when you reach uh, the last phase of your life, when you're no longer mobile, when you're um, increasingly uh, housebound or dependent, there's a quite different set of issues that people are interested in learning about. If the first age is very vocationally focused, if the second age is a balance of vocational focus and how do I help my children, as it were, if the third age is what can I give back, what, then the fourth age is overwhelmingly surely about reflection. What is the meaning of this journey I've been on through my life? How do I make sense of it? And how can I share that with other people? Wonderful course programs in intergenerational um, re re reflections where uh, reminiscence workshops in which the fascination of young people to hear the struggles of their, of their elders. Well, I think, you know, universities, colleges, public education systems, They've got roles in relation to each of those stages, but I invite you to go back and look at your own programmes and see how well we address each of them altogether. Um, I won't say much about this because Raoul, I didn't know you were going to be <laughs> coming and speaking, but Raoul, who speaking, borrows the expert. Well, one of the challenges about what I've been saying is that 
if you have the grand narratives of uh, keeping your, your uh, society and economy functioning, it can feel like uh, a little optional extra to be looking at how adult learning could contribute to these forms of social activity I've been describing. But at a subnational level, regional, city level, there's never enough resources to do everything. And it's much easier for people to work across boundaries, to cooperate, to see the whites of one another's eyes, and to make things happen. And that focus on cross-sectoral um, work on, on education, wider than education, including a whole range of, uh, of agencies, I think is pretty necessary to making a difference to equity, to inclusion, and the celebration of, of diversity. Well, I've talked too much, but I'd like to finish with this. I, I, I ran for um, 25 years a national body in the UK, and we started a, a, a celebration, Adult Learners Week, which celebrated the way existing adult learners have transformed their lives through education. We told their stories on the television, we organised parties, and uh, we invited every organisation to think what they could do. So uh, the permanent secretary of education swapped jobs with the head of Microsoft, and his deputy went and worked on the, on the reception desk in the education department. It was kind of how to play at being different, to learn that way. Well, we asked children in a London school What's lifelong learning about? And first they drew some wonderful pictures. Secondly, they said it's beautiful, fun, awesome, and cool. And that the age of learning never ends, at least for those of us who get to have the chance to join in. Thank you for listening to me.